everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Lisa Costello, and I'm the um, gallery director at Gertz Gallery. And we're here today at the Planetarium, and we're live on Facebook. Um, and we're here today to talk to Rachel Storm, who is the um, coordinator for the arts and culture uh, program at the city of Urbana. And um, so we're delighted to have her here today. She's going to talk about the Urbana Arts and Culture uh, grants that are available in a variety of different ways. And so we're hoping that we will encourage people to apply. And we want to see more artwork out there in our community. And so we're really delighted to have her here today. So Rachel, without further ado, I'm going to let you uh, get started. Thank you so much, Lisa. Welcome everyone tuning in online. Uh, we want to let you you know that if you are tuning in through social media, we're trying to keep an eye on things to see if there's any questions posed there. We do leave room at the end for a Q&A. So if you do have any questions, feel free to post them and we'll try to attend to them at the end of the session. If you have attended an Urbana Arts and Culture grant program in the past, um, a grant workshop, some of this information will be familiar to you, um, but hopefully it will be a refresher. I wanna um, start by saying that my name again is Rachel Lauren Storm. I serve as the arts and culture coordinator for the city of Urbana. I really do try to make myself available throughout this grant period for questions, comments, or feedback on arts grant proposals as much as I can provide. Um, so be sure to get in touch if you do plan to apply. We say apply early, um, but this is a workshop really designed to give you some information about what applying for an arts grant looks like. Um, I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about the Urbana Arts and Culture Program. So the Urbana Arts Program was established in 2008 to foster a city where all residents can engage in the arts and where artists can thrive and feel valued. In 2018, we renamed our program the Urbana Arts and Culture Programming Commission to really deeply reflect the inextricable relationship between arts and culture. We have a nine member advisory board that meets monthly and members are appointed by the mayor after applications are reviewed. It's important to note that if you do apply for an arts grant, you cannot apply to be a member of the advisory board um, as you cannot necessarily receive funding or be hired through our program, even for kind of gig opportunities or things like that during your tenure as a board member. That said, we of course always welcome people to consider being part of the Urbana Arts and Culture Commission. We do have periodic vacancies. And so if you know someone that you think would be excellent on our Arts and Culture Commission, we encourage you to um, invite them to get in touch and to submit an application on the Urbana Illinois website. It's urbanaillinois.us backslash boards. Here's our current membership of our commission. We are chaired by Barbara Hedlund, um, who you may know as uh, a leader within the CU Symphony Orchestra, Frank Modica, retired special education teacher and poet, Blair Ebony Smith, a professor of gender studies and art education, uh, Sarah Buckman, who also works as, as part of a gallery manager and outreach for the Common Ground Food Co-op, Luis Gonzalo Pinilla, who is also an art educator and art historian how, and visual artist, Howie Sheen, who also is a local potter, um, Heather Rose, who works a lot with art as a tool for healing, and Lori Fuller, who is a visual artist and painter and illustrator. We have a lot of different programs that, um, and of course today's focus is on grants, but the reason I tell you a little bit about some of our ongoing initiatives is because as you're developing a grant, we love for you to consider how that grant may interface with some of the programs that we offer. And many of our programs may actually serve as additional venues or opportunities for you to also share information about your program or to tie your program into some existing things in the community. So just really briefly, I'll mention a few different things that you could consider as you're kind of coming up with your own grant proposals. We do offer a monthly TV series called Art Now, where we feature different artists and arts organizations. This is a um, 15 minute long mini documentary series. So artists, if you're listening and you have not been featured on Art Now, please get in touch regardless of whether you submit a grant this year or not. We would love to see your work and be able to highlight you as an artist. We also have a Poet Laureate program with the city of Urbana. Our current Poet Laureate here is Ashanti Files. Ashanti is also someone who's been very collaborative with different grant recipients this past year. Her tenure ends in January and we will have a new Poet Laureate soon after, but really consider our landmark Poet Laureate program as an opportunity to collaborate with someone who's engaged in ongoing civic engagement throughout the year. 
We also are launching our Youth Poet Laureate program. We just closed applications and we will have an announcement about this before the end of the year. So that student will also be someone who would be wonderful to see some of these grant projects interface with in some capacity. We also have something called Artists of the Corridor where we feature ongoing exhibitions. Right now we have something called Juxtaposition, the art and words of Durango Mendoza on display at the city building as well as the Urbana Free Library. This is a great place to also um, showcase your artwork. So if your grant results in some visual art that could be exhibited, you might consider tying in an exhibition opportunity through Artist of the Corridor into your proposal. We also have a program called Young Artist Studio. We offer monthly. These are free art lessons taught by local artists in a wide variety of art forms, visual, performing arts, anything from puppetry to sewing to singing. Um, we've offered so many different um, workshops through this program, and we often tie workshops into existing grants with the support of that grant recipient. So for example, just this month, we will be featuring um, something that focuses on Kwanzaa in particular in conjunction with Kwanzaa 365, a program funded by us last grant cycle. I also wanna mention that we have an ongoing sculptures and murals program we collaborate with 40 North and Public Art League on our sculpture program. So if you're a sculptor artist, do consider submitting applications to that. It's an annual call through the Public Art League. And we actually select uh, basically rented sculptures for a period of two to three years. Um, and oftentimes those uh, periods are even renewed if the sculpture is really beloved and we wanna hang on to it a little bit longer. We also have um, two programs I wanna mention. One is Murals on Glass. So if your proposal may also be something that might tie into our Murals on Glass program, it would allow for any artworks created to be actually displayed on downtown area windows through printing them on adhesive vinyl. We select a different um, downtown municipal building every other year for Murals on Glass. And on opposite years, we have sculptures. Our utility box mural program is new and ongoing. So we have now art on utility boxes and we do annual calls for that. We just closed a call back in August. So we will be having those go in early spring and we will have another call go out late spring for the next round. Lastly, um, I wanna mention arts in the schools as a particular area of focus for our arts grants. So if you are collaborating with any of our K through 12 schools, you will also be eligible for checking a box called Arts in the Schools that may allow you to get that award in particular. These have to be arts education opportunities, so it has to take place during the school day. Your proposal cannot be part of an after school program to qualify for Arts in the Schools. It has to add arts education curriculum into the school. And I'm happy to talk to anyone more about that if you're interested in making connections with schools or thinking about that as a as even a facet of a larger grant proposal. Um, we do also encourage that applications can come from artists, but they can also come from educators. They can come from parents. They can come from family members. Um, as long as there is school um, uh, kind of co-signing on that grant, and we usually see that through a letter of support from the school. We also have a program that um, we're gonna be hopefully returning to this summer depending on our situation with COVID-19 and all the mitigations we've put in place. But Urbana's Downtown Get Down continues to be a summer festival series that we have where we actually showcase a wide variety of um, performing artists and different, um, different arts educate, different kind of arts opportunities for people in terms of having booths and um, street performances go on. So this is another thing that you can consider tying your work into as you plan your proposal. So that brings us to arts grants. Our grants support local artists and creative projects. We fund things like festivals, exhibitions, productions, and projects spanning a wide variety of arts mediums, visual art, music, performance, experimental arts, poetry or spoken word, dance or new media. Um, and the possibilities are endless. We really value proposals that bring on new collaborations, pro provide kind of new innovations, around spanning different arts mediums um, and bring different community groups together. So you're thinking about applying for a grant. 
Here's some things to know. We have funded over 300 local artists and artistic projects since the inception of the arts grant program. Um, we have a long history of funding a wide diversity of projects. A lot of times a grant, a grant um, program will be asked very frequently, what is it that you tend to fund? And that's actually a great thing to look for when you're applying for a grant is to look at what has been funded before and what th that, that grantor really likes to support. And the reassuring thing I wanna say to any of you considering applying for a grant is that there actually is no single thing that we fund. We really like to fund a diversity of projects every year. And that means that when we look at our lineup and we fund probably on average about 35 projects a year, that we see a real diversity of artistic medium. We see different intentional efforts outreaching to different groups and neighborhoods and communities in, in Urbana and beyond. We see unique collaborations between campus and community. We see a wide variety of venues being represented. That's really what we wanna see. And so that's, that's something that we encourage everyone to, to know and that is that your project belongs. The thing that you want to put forward belongs in that lineup. And we wanna kind of really encourage you to think through how can you make and enhance your project idea through things like collaborating with a lot of community organizations or thinking about how it can have facets take place in the schools or outside of the schools, in the neighborhoods or in the downtown. Let's talk a little bit about what we have funded in the past just to give you a, an example. So we funded things like Heartland Maker Fest, the Maker Festival put on by uh, Maker Lab Urbana. We funded the CU Folk and Roots Festival. We funded things like Midwest Mending and most recently CU Black and African Arts Festival. We funded Asian Heritage Month and we've also funded programs like Urbana First Fridays or downtown festivals. I wanna acknowledge that we have some specific program goals that we encourage you to incorporate into what you design. We want you to integrate the arts into the urban environment, create a sense of place and purpose. We want our grants to promote tourism and commerce and support for small businesses. We want to increase the availability of publicly accessible projects in the arts. We want people to really see the arts as for them. We want to encourage emerging artists and art forms. We want to preserve and commemorate local and multicultural traditions and histories. We wanna, of course, enrich the lives of Urbana residents and visitors. We wanna make sure that we're always increasing new opportunities for people to engage in the arts. We wanna represent the community in its full diversity. And we wanna encourage partnerships among artists, performers, businesses, and organizations. We really value collaboration. And one thing I want to encourage is that as the arts and culture coordinator for the city, I am also really interested in meeting with you, hearing about your project, helping brainstorm with you, maybe some organizations or individuals that I think could really benefit from collaborating with the project idea that you have. Um, and that's an area of interest in mine is really helping foster collaboration. So don't hesitate to reach out if you have no idea where to start around how to find collaborators. So good question, should I apply? Of course, the short answer is yes, you absolutely should apply, but there are some things that we often ask people to consider. Projects must be exhibited and performed within the city of Urbana. And really do understand that we live in a beautiful twin city environment, but these are Urbana um, tax funded grants and they do need to be within city limits of Urbana. If you have any question about whether something is within city limits, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, that doesn't mean that your project can't have aspects of it that take place outside of the city, but the primary um, function of the project, the big hurrah of your project needs to take place in Urbana. Uh, projects must be open and accessible to the public. We want them to be free um, pro, um, by and large. Uh, permanent installations are still not eligible, but I will say semi-permanent installations of things like murals and sculptures can also um, be qualify at this time. Although we do have some specific recommendations we give towards people seeking to put forth a mural proposal. So we do want to ask that anyone applying for murals do get in touch. We have some specific guidance we're gonna be um, issuing, but also we have some general kind of, you know, best practices that we wanna share with anyone um, applying for a mural. Projects cannot be mainly for fundraising or degree completion. Applicants can apply in up to two separate categories per grant cycle. That's something to underscore. Um, your two applications cannot depend on each other. So for instance, you cannot apply for a grant um, to do 
a music show and then their second grant is that we're the, the the entirety of that show or the show is a big festival because if the festival doesn't get funded then the music thing doesn't have a venue etc so they can't kind of depend on each other um, those awarded for grants in previous years are eligible to apply for a grant in 2022 however we do want to emphasize that if you have an outstanding project delayed due to COVID-19 very reasonably we do encourage you to complete that project before seeking a new grant the fact that your grant isn't completed will be disclosed during a jury session, and that will be taken into consideration by a jury. We wanna make sure that you have prioritized first any project that you need to complete. So that's for my repeat applicants, just for you to know, if you currently have a project, do wrap that project up before you apply for a new grant. So let's talk about grant categories. Um, we have six primary categories. The last two are on a slightly different time schedule. So we have tier one, tier two, tier three, and then arts in the schools, you'll see, and it might be difficult to read, but it's now within tier one. So for tier one, these are small um, individual or small scale projects. Five, between 500 and $1,500 is, is the ask and requirement for that grant. Tier two is for more mid-sized events, but it does require a 50% match. And that is between $1,500 and $4,500. Our tier three is our largest scale category. This is for large scale festivals or events. We require a 70% match. And that means that um, your grant from your ask of us represents 30% of the total project budget. And that the cost is between $5,000 and $10,000 that you're asking of the city. As I said before, arts in the schools are now housed within tier one. So if you have a tier one application and it meets the requirements of arts in the schools, that means that you have a collaboration within the school that you wanna work with. The, there's a, kind of a letter of support submitted from that teacher or that school administrator representing the school. And that there's also the project takes place within the school day. You can check that box and be considered for the arts in the schools award. The last two categories are poet laureate and youth poet laureate. They are on slightly separate applications. Um, and obviously poet laureate is for um, a local poet who would like to engage in civic engagement throughout the year to promote creative writing and connection through poetry. Uh, Youth poet laureate is in a similar position, but doing that um, from the perspective of someone who's between 13 and 18 years old. So just to give you some examples, um, tier one may fund things like a small jewelry making workshop or performances or works for harp and oboe um, inspired by sonnets. It, tier two could be something more like a larger event. Here we have an example of eight to create, um, eight hour creation festival. We've got BBL fine arts summer camp. So it's a different examples of a little bit larger projects, maybe impact a number of people or participants. And then tier three is gonna be your larger scale thing. So in the past, this has included things like Pygmalion Festival, Sweet Corn Festival, CU Folk and Roots Festival, um, these larger festivals or events. Um, and our process for tier three is quite different. So tier three actually does submit an application due the same date, so, um, so January 16th, but it should be noted that they are going to be presenting their proposals directly to the Arts Commission for consideration. And I'll get to that in a moment. So let's talk a little bit about the application process. First of all, we always encourage you to attend a grant workshop. So if you're tuning in right now, you're already ahead of the game. Excellent. We've offered grant workshops at many locations throughout town, and we will continue to offer them, um, especially circulate this online recording. Um, as I know, due to COVID, we've really wanted to create some online op opportunities as well. So good for attending today. You're already ahead of the game. Um, attending a workshop really helps give you kind of a leg up in understanding how to go about the application. So how do you apply? This year, for the first time ever, we are using all electronics new software for submitting grant applications. So if you've applied in the past, you've probably assembled PDFs or Word documents, um, lots of different um, pieces that are compiled here under required materials you've assembled them yourself. Now you're going to be able to upload them directly into our neighborly portal. So that link at the top is also right on our website and that's where you will go to submit your application. 
All application and supporting documents need to be submitted by 1159 Central Time on Sunday, January 16th, 2022. We do not typically extend this deadline, so please get that in on time. I also want to just give you a quick overview of what um, is entailed. So if you have applied before, there's a couple of things that may have changed with the application, but largely it remains the same as last year's. It's just electronic. So that means that we do still need kind of an overview of the applicant group or any artist bios. We need evidence of tax exempt status if it's applicable. We do need a description of your proposed project. We require a promotions and marketing plan. So at least that to hear that you have really thought through promotions and marketing. Um, and that means too, that you think dynamically about that. So not just, you know, I'm gonna put it online, but also where else are you gonna put it? What kinds of um, creative marketing strategies are you going to use? How will you ensure it reaches maybe historically underserved populations of our community? You also need a description of any project partners. So if your pro project involves you collaborating with a nonprofit organization or a community group or a venue, make sure you include those project partner descriptions. Work samples, as well as an index of your work samples are required. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. And of course, you do need to make evidence of your matching support. So if you're applying for a tier two or three, it's important that you have your matching support outlined in your budget. So just a little bit about work samples. Um, you're gonna upload digital files directly into your online application. We can accept images, videos, audio files, and they're gonna be uploaded directly into Neighborly. We are gonna submit, you're gonna submit along with your, um, with any work samples an image identification sheet. And then you're going to label your files in this particular way. And that just helps us really keep track of everything. Um, you should have no more than eight work samples and now you can no longer submit more than eight work samples because we are able to limit that in our portal on the side that we manage. So we have had people sometimes submit more than eight. We only look at eight. So when you do that, you're taking kind of a gamble at what we will look at. Um, and that means eight of any combination. So if you're submitting like an image and then like a rendering and then maybe a description, a written description or your CV or something, each of those things is a work sample. <clears throat> Couple of restrictions that I want to acknowledge. Um, we do require workman's compensation for specific pro, uh, projects with employees. Um, this doesn't always apply to the majority of grant applications, but if you are hiring employees through the grant um, to work on a project, you may need to provide workman's copies, compensation. We also require liability insurance. So for instance, if you're painting a mural and you are going to be doing scaffolding, if you are somebody who... Um, you know, fire spins and you're going to do a fire show, you will need to provide performance insurance. Um, so you can actually put that into your budget as well. We do have some funding restrictions that are important to note. We cannot um, use our grant funds as for the purchase of non-consumable materials. So you can't purchase a new computer, a new camera or power tools. Um, where this gets a little um, on sort of, maybe sometimes people have some confusion, is just to understand that that also um, does mean that you can, you can purchase things that you will use. If you are an artist that's, um, you know, you need some paint, you need some canvases, absolutely. But you can't purchase larger equipment um, with this kind of grant. And if you have any questions about that, please get in touch because I can give you some advice. Um, for the completion of degree work too, you cannot use this grant. Um, so it cannot be used necessarily to create your thesis project. Um, and it cannot be for any event conducted solely or primarily as a fundraiser. Um, and that's really important to emphasize because that has um, led to some applications being rejected in the past. So be sure that you're not um, using it to um, fundraise. And of course, we ask you to make sure that no copyrighted material is performed or played without necessary approval and appropriate license fees. And that should be outlined in your application proposal. It's also important to note that we do not fund inherently religious activities, such as religious worship, instruction, or proselytization. But as a note, I want to emphasize that faith-based organizations are absolutely eligible to apply for an Urbana Arts Grant to support the non-religious cultural and arts programming that they provide. And proposals should take care to outline and separate in time or location any inherently religious activities from any arts or cultural programming. And I'm happy to talk you through that if you're a faith-based organization eager to apply. 
For any project um, serving as a political endorsement, we also restrict this fund. So it cannot fund things that look like a political endorsement or are a political endorsement. We also do not fund cash prizes, gifts, or giveaway items. So do note that when you're coming up with a budget. For any honorarium or salary or service payments to any city of Urbana staff or members of the Urbana Arts and Culture Commission. As I said earlier, if you join our commission, you are ineligible to be paid directly through our program. Of course, the same is true of staff. So make sure that you're clear about that when you apply. And of course, any projects that serve as commercial advertising. This is important to note, especially for folks um, perhaps doing things like murals, like sometimes we'll get asked, can I do, um, you know, have somebody paint my sign for my business? Um, we do have some business grants at the city of Urbana that would be more appropriate for that. For these arts grants, we do not allow them to serve as commercial advertising. Okay, so let's talk about what's next. Um, January 16th is the date all applications are due. On January 18th, for those tier three applicants, we will be having a special meeting where they give presentations of their proposals in person in that public meeting. Between January 19th and February 7th, we will have an evaluation period for all tiers. That's both our commission evaluating tier three, as well as our juries evaluating tiers one and two. On February 8th, um, we will have a vote on tier three and we will be able to announce at that public meeting of the Urbana Arts and Culture Commission, our 2022 recipients. Um, the very next day, we will give formal notice to all recipients. And then fast forward about a month on March 10th, we will have our sneak peek celebration. And this is for everyone, regardless of whether you're funded or not, applying or not, we have an annual event celebrating what's to come for our arts scene funded through the Urbana Arts Grant Program. It's a great opportunity to come out and support other artists. So save that date. Um, we are still determining whether it will be online or in person. Um, as soon as we have more information, it'll be released through our pages online. Um, March 15th, our grant agreement is due for selected applicants. You'll get more information of that around that if you're funded, of course. Okay, and then let's see. Just to let you know, so typically the flow of this grant um, application period is that we open up the application portal. Grant workshops like this one are offered throughout the community. I also offer drop-in grant hours. So I'll be announcing some of those where people can just drop in on a Zoom meeting and get one-on-one -on -one support with me. Um, we will have all grant applications due. Then of course, there's a staff review for eligibility and completeness. Then we send them to juries. So this is just to kind of share a little bit of the flow to you so that you understand our process. Um, so save this slide, screenshot this, if you wanna take a look at what our process is. Okay, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about who's on these juries, right? And so that's a question we get a lot. Um, these are the folks who are selecting the grant, um, grant recipients. And the other thing to understand is that I am not a member of the jury as your arts and culture coordinator. And that is why I'm in a position where I can give you direct feedback. I can take a look at things, answer questions that you have. I'm not voting on your proposal. So it's really in my interest and yours to help you put your best foot forward. And that's why I really like to give that individual attention as much as I can. We have two jury panels to review. You. Um, they review different applications. Each consists of five to six artists, arts, administers, arts administrators, or engaged citizens. Um, here's some stuff we take into consideration. We want to make sure that we have um, educational and professional qualifications from different jurors. We take not only social identity diversity, but also diversity of representation of, the, of, of different art forms and art mediums, um, and then familiarity with our local art scene and our, and our local community. So these are different things that we take into consideration as we're assembling a diverse jury of representatives. And of course, we love to have people who are not applying but have received grants in the past come back and serve as jurors. So if you're tuning in right now, you've applied and received an arts grant in the past, but you're not sure if you're gonna apply this year, this could be another great way to be involved with the arts grant process this year. And I encourage you to reach out to me if you're somebody who would love to help evaluate this year. Um, we also, of course, um, make sure that there's not a conflict of interest. And what we do is um, we really try to um, give jurors an opportunity to say that they feel like they can't be impartial because of X, Y, or Z. Um, and of course, some of this is, is feeling, right? There's some of the obvious things like you can't evaluate somebody who's a family member or a relative. Um, you shouldn't evaluate somebody who you know, has a very clear conflict of interest. 
but there may also simply be people who, you know, they take a look at an application and say, hey, I've had a conflict with this person in the community for a long time, or I know this person and I don't know if I could be impartial. You know, whatever it is, we give that juror the opportunity to, to leave the jury and not participate in the evaluation. So we take a lot of care around conflict of interest and make sure, because, you know, we're a smaller town. Um, I know we're a big town to some, but we're a smaller town to some. And, you know, a lot of us know each other in the art scene. So we also really take a lot of care around that. We have two separate meetings. They're moderated by the arts coordinator. Um, the jurors review application materials in advance. They're actually gonna be able to score them through Neighborly. And then on that day, they bring those initial scores and we take down those scores at the beginning of the meeting. Um, and then we kind of go through and talk together about each application as a group. And that's where um, people are given the opportunity to adjust their scores after listening to each other. If somebody notices something that other people didn't notice um, and, it, and it incur for some reason it makes them want to change their score, they're given the opportunity to do so. The scores are finalized and then we have a ranking and then we have the challenge of trying to give out the limited amount of money that each jury has been given. Um, and that's where things sometimes are heartbreaking for everyone because truly what I see over and over again is everyone wants everything to be funded as much as possible. There's tremendous applications, great ideas coming from almost all of our applicants. And so, you know, that's, that's the process that we go through. And if you haven't served on a jury before, I think it's very illuminating. And hopefully it also is an experience that helps um, affirm for people that your project belongs um, and that sometimes things aren't funded simply because we've run out of funding and we can't fund everything that we love. You know, so that's something to note as well. We judge on three things primarily. This is artistic quality, community integration, and project feasibility. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each. So artistic quality, of course, we judge that based on your work samples, maybe even your artist biographies. So for instance, is the person applying to do um, you know, this project, does, does that person have the relevant experience um, to be able to perform that project? That also kind of leans a little bit into project feasibility. So how, um, how kind of set up for success is this project? Has it moved from idea to plan? Um, many people have good ideas. We want the who, what, where, when, and why. We want that really spelled out in an application. And when you're writing, you want to be able to be clear. You could keep it very like simple. Um, you don't have to get flowery. We live in a very academic town. So a lot of my applicants are also people that want to give me lots of background. You don't actually have to give lots and lots of background. Um, we know and value your idea. So really it is spelling out the details that are most important. And of course, very key is community integration. So how does this program not only represent Urbana? So how, why here? Why should it be here? And what is so important about this particular project taking place here and now? I think being able to answer that question is important. And then how are you bringing the community together? What effort are you making to maybe reach out to um, underserved populations? Maybe uh, um, people that don't necessarily engage with your art form as readily as others. You know, thinking about who is here and who is not. Thinking about how we create better access and engagement um, that's what we really want to see through community integration, that you've given a lot of thought to that. And I should say, too, on the note of community integration, things like collaboration are a great way to tell that story. And they really do show this project has supporters, has collaborators. We've thought thoughtfully about how to um, connect with different facets of the community. So be thinking about that as you form collaborations. So on average, over 50% of applications are funded, um, but some projects do not receive the full amount requested. And that's important to understand because um, we get down to those moments where juries are often stuck with, okay, am I going to fund at 100% these applications that we like and we're able to fund a lot less? Or are we able to say, well, this application asked for you know, bottled water and we think they should be able to get that donated somewhere. So we're going to take some funding off of there and see if we can fund another project. That is oftentimes the dilemma that juries find themselves in. Um, we do give some guidance. We say that they cannot fund less than 50% of requested funding amount and that the program does reserve the right to award grant proposals for less than the, the amount requested. Um, and then we also do calculate the amount available for each category after we receive applications. So even though we tend to receive applications in all categories, 
Um, if ever we did not receive any tier one applications and we had all applications submitted to tier two or something like that, then the majority of the funding would move into tier two. So of course we, we do take a lot of care to ensure that we can fund the most amount of projects that we're able to. Um, just wanna tell you very briefly um, that we are funded by tax incremental financing districts. Um, this of course, uh, we do have some maps that encourage you to understand a little bit what is within our TIF district and what isn't. We have two funds. So we have a, a downtown TIF that we fund from, and that means that it needs to, um, that, that a project being funded through that fund will need to take place in downtown. Um, our downtown TIF is actually um, much bigger than maybe your main street. Um, it, does, it does cover a lot more space and we do have maps available. Um, but then we also have general funds that fund our programs. So if you have a project that doesn't take place anywhere near the downtown, it's absolutely still eligible, very much can still be funded. Um, but because we also have this additional fund through downtown TIF, if you're doing something like, let's say you're doing a neighborhood project and it's in a neighborhood far and away from downtown, you might consider that the project maybe ends with an exhibition or with some sort of event in the downtown, because then it gives you the opportunity to have that portion funded through our downtown TIF. Um, if you have questions about this and, and funding, I don't want you to get too caught up in it because the, the truth is we have funds available um, to fund anything taking place within the city of Urbana. But if you do want to um, also contribute to the vibrancy of our downtown and want to consider having a portion of your event take place there, I'm happy to talk that through with you and help you think about venues or things like that. We have some examples here of downtown TIF district venues, such as the Urbana Champaign Independent Media Center, Lincoln Square Mall, a multitude of our downtown businesses, the library, our new hotel warrior that will be going in. So lots of things to consider. And here are some maps around TIF that you can find on the city of Urbana's website. I, I do wanna mention it, but I don't want you to get too caught up in it. The truth is, is that there's lots of ways to be funded. And um, I haven't been in a situation where we like run out of funding um, to be able to fund something more generally. It's, it's never really come up. So. I imagine that um, it's just helpful for you to know where the funding comes from um, and then why sometimes it can be beneficial to have a portion of the event take place in our TIF district. All right, crafting your grant proposal. So this is uh, the last section of this grant workshop and I know it's been lengthy. I wanna give you some time to, to kind of take it all in and ask questions, but these are pretty straightforward and these are actually great recommendations no matter what kind of grant you're applying to, whether it's one of ours or state or federal grants, um, we really want you to think through the details. Um, so move the thing from an idea to concretes. Um, make sure all your information, your proposals up to date and relevant. And this is very important. Do not assume the jury panel knows anything about you or your project. You could have the most popular event in Champaign-Urbana and you still shouldn't assume that. Um, make sure everything is well explained the mission of your program is very clear. Make sure your work samples actually support your proposal. This is important for my like Jack and Jane and whoever of all trades people, people who have like lots of different, um, you know, areas of the arts they work in. If you're giving me a visual art proposal, make sure you emphasize your visual art background, right? If you're giving me a dance proposal, I wanna see your dance background. You can show that you're so um, diverse and, and you have a multitude of, of talents. And we of course value that but you wanna make sure your work samples speak directly to your proposal. And of course, make sure your budget is realistic. Um, that's something that obviously will come up for debate in a jury meeting. So if somebody thinks the numbers are way too inflated or also on the other end that people aren't valuing themselves enough, um, that will be a topic of conversation on a jury panel. And what I run into more than anything isn't inflated numbers. I run into artists not valuing themselves and their work enough. And of course, it's also because we're looking for funding to carry out a project, a project that we wanna see happen, right? So, so we're thinking more about the materials we need or the space venue fees or anything else, but artists, make sure you're paying yourself. Make sure you're giving yourself both funding for the administration of the program that you're, you're suggesting that you're going to administer, but also for your work as an artist. We have two areas of the budget for this. We have an area where you can say, this is the cost of my time administering this project. And that's, you know, the emails you're sending, the things that you're creating, um, the time that you have to take to do logistical work. 
And then there's your artistic work. So if you're also an artist on the project, pay yourself. I cannot emphasize that enough. I get way too many applications where people aren't even remotely paying themselves. They're just thinking about all the other fees and materials they need. So I'm gonna shout that to the rooftops, pay yourself artists. It's so important. We want these um, projects to go into direct funding for our local artists. Of course, be specific about expected outcomes. Remember evaluation criteria, again, that artistic quality, community integration, project feasibility. And I'm happy to meet with you and talk about any feedback on those three criteria on a proposal. We have the 10 C's, be clear, be concise, be credible, and all the other words that are start with C that are there. <laughs> the truth is though, take your time. Um, don't be overly flowery. I'm, a, I'm one of those flowery writers and I gotta scale it back. You know, you gotta make sure you edit. And I always say, have somebody read it that isn't um, coming from your particular discipline or your particular area. Um, so that you also see how it's read by someone who is unfamiliar with your work. This is an example of when we had a paper application, what our budget looks like, but now it's exactly the same thing. It's just electronic. So you could see, just as I mentioned at the top, we have personnel. There's things like artistic funding for you, administrative funding that you are also doing. Now it could be you, it could be a number of people working on your project, but make sure to pay your artists. Okay, here's some other tips. Of course, take plenty of time to put the application together. If you have questions, ask us. Ask us as early as you can. After I give one of these workshops, I'll get a lot of people reaching out. Um, be gentle. I'm trying to get through a lot of email and really try to give you a response. So um, take also advantage of things that I offer like drop-in grant hours, because that allows me to kind of carve out some specific time to have one-on-one -on -one meetings. And then have a specific work plan. Okay, very important, letters of support are not always required, like for arts in the schools, it is required, but for not all of applications, do you need them? Um, at the same time, they are tremendous. They are so helpful. Um, they really do up that feasibility score because we see not simply like, I wanna work with that person on a project or I intend to work with this nonprofit organization, but we see that nonprofit, that person, that collaborator saying, I'm so excited about this project. I'm really excited to work on it in these ways, and we are committed to, to working on it should it be funded, right? So that's very important too. All right, so what happens next? Hooray, hopefully you're funded. There's a rousing you know, pile of people clapping for you at Craner Performing Arts Center, but you are funded, and that's what we hope happens, right, to as many people as possible. Of course, another outcome could be um, that you are not funded, but if, should you be funded, you're entering into agreement with the city. Your project will be um, something that we can collaborate together on. We hope that you reach out throughout the duration of your project. Um, you'll go through an orientation where I go through all of these details of how we can work together. Um, but once your project's finished, you do a final report and you present to the Arts and Culture Commission about your project. Um, something to note. The majority of our um, recipients will receive half of their funding up front and then half upon completion of their project. And then our tier three applications receive everything at the end of their project. Um, and of course that we can help each other. And then one thing I did not mention, but I want to especially emphasize, um, and that is that we also are asking of course that when you um, are thinking about feasibility that you also take COVID-19 into consideration. So be thinking about what mitigations, what safety precautions are you putting in place to make sure that your event can safely move forward? You know, unfortunately, we're not out of the woods with this. We got to keep thinking about, for instance, if we do have to at all reduce the amount of gathering that's happening, how will your event move forward? So having kind of a plan B outline is very, very helpful in, in your feasibility score. Okay, so we're, we're of course hoping that you're funded, but if you are not we want to really remind you that this is not the end. Don't take it personally. Funding can be competitive. It does take a couple of tries to craft a winning proposal. And of course, remember what I said before, we have, I have consistently seen in all of my years being the arts coordinator and serving on these juries is that we often simply run out of funding, which means fund the arts, of course. <laughs> it means increase and fund the arts as much as possible. But it also means that it's not that your proposal wasn't fabulous, right? So find out, you know, is there anything that could have been improved by contacting the coordinator, that would be me, um, and discuss the jury's comments on your application. 
and then look for other grants opportunities. Cause the truth is, is if you put all these things together, then you have got the recipe for another grant. Um, cause typically a lot of our granting organizations at even the state or federal level, we're asking for similar things. So you've got all of your ducks in a row, find out what you could do to put the icing on the cake and then resubmit it somewhere else. It's important to note that typically our deadline is a month ahead of Illinois Arts Council's individual artist grants. So you're in good position to apply for that um, should you be able to. All right, that brings me to the end of the presentation. I wanna make sure that you have my contact information here. There's my office number, there's my email, and here's our website where you can download the guidelines for 2022 grants and submit your application through the Neighborly Portal. I wanna see if there's any questions or comments. So if you haven't used it yet, use that Facebook um, live stream to add your comments or questions in and we'll address them now. Great. Hey, Rachel, um, I have a couple of questions um, that I was thinking about. So if you're an artist and you think, oh gosh, I really want to do this, but I don't know exactly what some of the ways to go about it would be, um, like would, would, would the grant fund maybe a framing of artwork for an exhibition or printing out photos or what are some of the things that you've seen in the past with, with applicants that are successful? Yeah, absolutely. Any of those things you just mentioned can absolutely be put into a budget. Um, so for something like a visual art exhibition, you can have the art prepared, printed. If you need to create the art and you need paint, you need canvases, you need photography or photo paper, you need you know, development, anything like that, you can absolutely get that funded through the arts grant program, but it can also fund things like your marketing and promotional materials for an exhibition opening. It can fund the space reservation fee for the gallery you're gonna collaborate with. And by the way, when we say pay artists, I also mean pay your small businesses, pay your venues. We are, you know, we all know we need more venues in Champaign-Urbana. We just want more and more and more because we need it. So the way we cultivate more is to also make sure that venues not only are invited to consider, how they could have an exhibition or a performance or a show in their space. And I mean, yes to things like our Garrett's Gallery, but also things like our, um, you know, our cafes or any number of smaller places that maybe haven't considered um, having shows yet or bookstores, anything like that. So all of those things, make sure you're paying those places too and working that into your budget. It can pay for your time. It can pay for an artist time. Let's say you had an exhibit, but you had a live guitarist at your exhibit, or you had a poetry night and you wanted to pay the poets who came, you wanted to pay the guitarists, you needed to rent music equipment so that they had their drum set there, <laughs> you needed to rent a generator. I mean, anything that you can do. Oftentimes too, when we talk about that, like we won't fund things that are non-consumable. It does mean that we can fund things that are rented. So you might not be able to buy a camera, but you might be able to rent a camera um, for the purposes of your project. Oh, that's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. And then let's say I'm uh, maybe a poet or, uh, you know, I play guitar and I'd like to perform, but I don't really know where to go. Um, do you have a list of places in that TIFF district or in Urbana that are available? I'm assuming that many of the, the, like you wouldn't fund something in a private home. Is that correct? Like say you. That we have gotten applications like that before. Okay. And I will say it's not that we flat out say no, but it is, of course, it, it becomes a question of whether that person is permitted by city, you know, by, by city policy to have something like that um, be a public space or a public event. Um, and then because it often carries some scrutiny it won't be championed as loudly in a jury meeting because people are trepidatious of like, well, how public is this really, right? right. So we've, we've had that come up before um, because what we really do is we want it to be free and accessible and people's homes don't always feel free or accessible to, right, yeah. to attend to something. And so it's not that we say no, but I say, you know, really be cautious there um, because it could be that it's really more of an inclusive event if we 
happen in a more public venue. So if someone is thinking, oh gosh, I'd like to play my guitar somewhere, mm -hmm. would they talk to you about finding venues? Is that, is Absolutely. that a good um, question? Mm -hmm. Is that a good thing to send? Like say if someone asked me after this event where I would send them to, to talk to you about that? Yeah. And okay. if I talk to them, um, and I think like any number of people, you know, when you're thinking about venues, think about some of these questions. What do you want out of a venue? What kind of setup do you need to have there? Are you able to bring your own acoustic equipment? Are you, do you need the event to already have some things in place? Um, what kind of budget do you have? What kind of space needs are there? Um, who are you trying to reach? And of course we care about things like accessibility. Um, many of our historic downtown buildings aren't necessarily wheelchair accessible. That doesn't mean we won't fund it. We certainly want um, uh, all of our downtown historic venues and businesses to also benefit from these grants. So we won't say no, but we want some care and thoughtfulness put in place about what are we going to do if, if somebody can't access this event. And that's where your community integration piece could come in. Because maybe, you know, it is that I have a venue, it's unfortunately on the second floor, of a building and I have no elevator. There's no way for someone to get into the event, um, but I really wanna have it in my business. But you have a satellite stream of it, or you have um, a, a, another portion of the event or the same event duplicated in another venue or something to make sure that there's some means or way for someone to participate um, in, a, in where there might be structural barriers to participation. Um, and that's a good thing in general when we think about, I think what, this pandemic has illuminated. We think a lot about, you know, that it's sort of illuminated that there are many benefits to being online, but we also, and we've had, you know, for many of us, the pandemic has meant like more Zoom meetings, more things on, held virtually. Um, and that has often closed doors to people who can't get um, involved virtually or maybe don't have um, Wi Fi or don't have access for a wide variety of reasons. Um, and then, of course, that's held in a, in a kind of careful balance with the fact that for some others, um, being in person was the barrier. And so actually having those virtual options have been really wonderful for yeah. a wide variety of reasons. Could be disability accessibility, could be trauma and, you know, wanting to not necessarily be in crowded spaces. It could be anything. It could be your work third shift, right? And I can't <laughs> come out to the thing. So when you're thinking about um, planning events, I, and thinking about community integration, I think it's actually really brilliant to think about hybrid events. Like how can your event live in a virtual space too? And so thinking about that when you apply might up that score too. So if you did performance work or you were a dancer or musician, you could use those funds to pay for a videographer to yes. help? Yes, okay. yes. And that was a huge thing that came up for us during this whole experience with COVID is we've been talking a lot about our applicants, especially those who applied before we went into shelter in place back in March, 2020, who had a completely different idea of what their grants were going to do. Of course, we've been talking a lot about, you know, how can you move towards a virtual event? If you're asking for a budget amendment, you know, maybe think about paying that videographer or hiring someone that can help you turn it into a virtual event. Mm -hmm. And we also have a lot of local artists that have been really working diligently about creating digital spaces for our arts to live. So there's a lot of, um, I think, support for that kind of work right now. I think we have another question in the audience. Oh, no, I misunderstood. Um, I do have um, one more question, and then I think we need to wrap it up here. But um, many times, I think from the grants that I've seen, I know I've served on your um, the jury panel before, um, people, always, people had maybe an educational component, and maybe that's what you're talking about with the community access, but um, like maybe teaching a workshop. So they might be a painter, um, and then they teach a workshop, or they might play guitar, but then they teach a, a you know, how to make a musical instrument workshop. Is yeah. that something that's common with them? Or is that maybe that was just a irregularity on the time that I served on the... <laughs> No, it's common, but I would say it's not a requirement, but the okay. reason why it's lovely is that we also value when we move Urbana residents and visitors from audience into participant. Right. So it doesn't mean that you can't apply for a concert and simply encourage your audience to engage in that concert and be there and dance or, or you know, experience it in some way. 
that's absolutely appropriate. It, it likely will be funded, right? But the other thing that um, maybe makes it even better is when we have opportunities for people to really connect with that artist, to learn from that artist, or to experience the art form in a new way. Um, so those, those just kind of enrich applications. But I'll give you an example. Like we've had applica applicants who are maybe from, you know, you don't have to live in Champaign-Urbana to apply for these grants. You can live in Hawaii and apply for these grants. You can mm -hmm. live anywhere and apply for these grants as long as you're applying for a project that will take place within the city of Urbana. Um, that said, um, typically what we've seen is maybe some applications from Chicago or some applications from a metropolitan city. And it, it'll be from somebody who maybe is traveling on a tour and they want to stop in Urbana, right? Um, nice. And there's a lot of value to that. Um, and it's, it's certainly something that isn't, um, you know, unworthy of being funded. But the thing to understand is that um, we would really want to see on that application, like, why Urbana? You know, like, and how are you engaging Urbana? Yes, you're offering a wonderful show. We all want to see it. That sounds fabulous. You know, but could the show maybe recruit actors or performers from Urbana? Is there an opportunity for Urbana to, part, you know, participate in, and not just Urbana, but our area, our local artists and community members to participate more thoughtfully? Will the show also make a pit stop at one of our schools? Is there some sort of other engagement beyond just we're stopping in your town? Um, and so when I've seen a poor application <laughs> coming from that realm, it'll usually be one where it's like, I haven't explored venues in Urbana, but I feel pretty confident I'll find, you know, like a restaurant to do the sad or a theater. Um, and I'm not really sure, but I think I'm going to collaborate with a teacher. <laughs> so all of that sounds like a lovely idea, but it's not moved from idea into plan. Yes. Yeah, and so big. when we lack in the plan, that's the score is just going to go down. Great. Well, thank you so much mm -hmm. for um, sharing all of this information. It's really terrific for our students and uh, the community at large. So we really appreciate you coming here today, Rachel, and really explaining that so clearly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. For anyone tuning in, apply. This is for you. <laughs> we really want to see your work. We want you to put your foot forward. And if it's, you know, a foot that needs to be encouraged to be its best, reach out to the arts coordinator. I'm really happy to help you. Um, and I will be announcing drop-in hours. So this um, video will continue to live online and we encourage you to come back and rewatch it. I know there's a lot of information in a short period of time, um, but you'll also get an opportunity to bring an idea, even if it's just in its real infancy, a little tiny idea to be um, kind of talked about or workshopped individually um, to, at one of these drop-in hours and um, get in touch early because this is a very busy time for a lot of uh, folks to be asking questions. And I, I really want to give you my attention. So get in touch early, apply, visit our website. It's www.urbanaillinois.us backslash arts grants. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you everyone for being here. Have a lovely evening.